Monday, Thursday means a lot. Monday, Thursday, when our Lord went into the garden and his visible agony began and he began to shed the blood in his sweat and was facing the duress and going through it. On the Thursday, when he washed the disciples' feet to set them an example of taking the place as the lowest servant, I've set an example as I have done, so you should do for each other. And, of course, the establishment before that of the sacrament of Holy Communion. And that may be a little bit painful for some people, because this year, 2020, so many people will not be able to be in church and enjoy the Eucharistic celebration on Maundy Thursday or Easter or the, the it, do in church be present for Good Friday, all of this, the whole Holy Week and Easter. But so the, well, to, to talk about Holy Communion may just seem a little bit uh, insensitive of me when you, when you, possibly feeling deprived and it, I, I hope you are feeling a loss because if you aren't it's not healthy but I want to say this I want to say we will gather again we will gather again there have been people kept from having holy communion because of things beyond their control and, or gathering for the Eucharistic uh, celebration I know that my father spent both a Christmas and a Holy Week and Easter in combat in World War II fighting against the Germans, unable to be in church or with his family even. So sometimes these things are interrupted, but, but that's temporary. And this is not going to be the new normal. But I am going to say this. When we gather together again, there are things I know that we must bring back with us. Faith, hope, and charity. Let's bring those things back to the table of our, the communion rail. But there are certain things that I hope we do not bring back with us. And maybe now is the time to learn about how to leave certain things behind that we should never bring with us. But before I get into that, I'm going to read to you Jeremiah chapter 31, starting at verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, and I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I wasn't husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, after those days, saith the Lord, I'll put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Here you have the prophecy of a new covenant. And this prediction, this predictive prophecy of the new covenant is never fulfilled in the Old Testament scriptures. It, it, it gets mentioned again only when Jesus says the words of institution holding the cup, the new covenant. And then the translations we have from Greek, it says New Testament, which is explained in the epistle for of the Hebrews, and like a covenant, a testament can't be just simply set aside, and it can only be established by the death of the testator, just as a covenant requires death. Well, it's a new covenant that God would establish. Brit Hadasha. I say that in Sephardic Hebrew for those of you who learned Ashkenazi. Brit Hadasha. They didn't hear the words New Covenant again until Jesus spoke the, the, those words of institution. And it's very deeply meaningful. The epistle reading 
for Maundy Thursday is from the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And it begins with the 23rd verse, I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. I'm going to do the same thing right now I did in my Palm Sunday sermon. I'm going to back up. I'm going to let us consider those words in context. I'm going to back up to verse 17. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, to one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone take it before another his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? Have you not houses to eat and drink in? Who despise you the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, The cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. And now I'm going to go ahead a bit beyond where the appointment of the reading ends. Verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But... Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another, and if any man hunger, let him eat at home. But you come not together in the condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. When you hear it in context, there's a couple things that are a bit different that come out in the text. In fact, the whole emphasis of the text is a bit different than it sounds when you just read that other excerpt, which the smaller excerpt is important it tells you what happened and paul is telling them what happened he's not writing liturgy he's telling them what happened for a reason and i say he's not writing liturgy because we anglicans you know that's in our holy communion prayer and the night in which he was betrayed he took bread we get those words from first corinthians 11 before we get the rest of the words of our prayer basically from from the Gospel of Matthew. But the, the, that, those words are included. Well, Paul wasn't writing liturgy. He was reminding them that this happened in the context of the Lord's night of being betrayed. And basically, he's telling them that their intention, their purpose, when they gather is not to have the Lord's Supper. And that when they gather, even for the Holy Eucharist, that there's a betrayal. And how is it that some of them are betraying the Lord just as surely as Judas did when he was at that table for the first celebration, the first the institution of this supper? How are they doing it? First, let me point out to you something. I don't believe as Anglicans that we are supposed to be all bent out of shape over the various different concepts of what is happening in the sacrament. 
There's been so many people who want to argue over it. And in terms of what Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood, you, can, you cannot draw a conclusion uh, that, that gives you a basis for your division from other believers. You just can't. If anything, it's the words of Paul here that make it clear that there is some kind of objective reality. It's the words of Paul that tell us that, not what Jesus says in the words of institution. But Paul, because he says, if you eat this bread and drink this cup unworthily, you're guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And he warns that there are consequences of chastening in this life. In this life, by the way, he makes it clear that the chastening is in this life that we, is most common. That's the, the examples he points out, being weak and sickly and dying prematurely. But the thing I want to make clear here is that Paul is telling them about a betrayal that has some absolute integral association with the meaning of this sacrament and with this sacrament and the reality of it. So instead of all these con concerns about what exactly is happening, how is the Lord present? Causing people to argue about things as, such as transubstantiation and consubstantiation and all of this, to which I say, none of those arguments are anything but a waste of time. The fact is Christ is present and you will never understand it and neither will I, don't even try. But understand this, because he's present, you must approach it reverently. And to approach it reverently must mean that you approach it in love and unity with the other people in the church. There are some people who have decided that the Holy Communion is a personal matter between me and God, or you and God. Actually, it's not just between you and God. It involves the church. It involves the body of Christ. So how is it that in Corinth, some of these people demonstrated that they didn't recognize the Lord's body? Well, if you read the context, it's not because they didn't believe in transubstantiation, a notion that simply would not have made any sense to, the, to them at that time or to, to the, the disciples of Jesus, or that they didn't all have the same doctrine of real presence or understanding because there's really no way anybody can wrap their minds around it anyway. That's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about a doctrinal litmus test. I'm sorry, it's just not. It's talking about how they treated each other. Why? Because when he's talking about not discerning the Lord's body, the text is making it clear. He's talking about the Lord's body both in terms of the sacrament on the altar, as we would say today, both in terms of the body and blood of Christ in the bread and wine that, that we partake of, that have become his body and blood, and also the Lord's body, as in the other members of the church. And if you recognize the reality of Christ's presence, in the sacrament, on the altar, but don't recognize it fully in all that it means. In the presence of his body that is kneeling beside you at the altar rail, that is in with you in this building, that some standing up in the pews coming forward, some having returned, if the priest himself is there also, all the people who are members of the body. If you don't understand the Lord's body, in the context of the church. You're also not recognizing it. So you can have the perfect understanding. And by the way, you don't. No one does. But you can have perfect understanding of what's happening in the sacrament regarding the body of, of Christ and the blood of Christ. And whatever 
the change is and all that, that, that could be used to describe it. You get a perfect understanding of that. But if you are not treating your brethren and your in the church, if you're not treating the other members of the body of Christ, the church, with love, forgiveness, and with the priority of a real unity, then it doesn't matter what you, what you believe about the sacrament. It's totally immaterial. What you believe about it is irrelevant at that point. If you're out of sorts with your neighbor. You know, you've got to understand. If you really believe in the incarnation, if you really believe the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, if you really believe that Jesus, who is equal to God, also became a man, came to us in the form of a man and being found in fashion as a man. If you really believe that, then you know why you can't separate the two great commandments in the summary of the law. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You can't separate these if you believe in the incarnation. You can't love God and receive the sacrament worthily if you don't love your brother. You know, I believe that those of us in the continuing church really do fit Psalm 95 and as our dear Archbishop Mark Haviland said in the Anglican Catholic Church, you know, he just read it and we all instantly got it. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation. He didn't have to, he didn't have to even expound on it, just mentioned it in the context of what was happening as we were all coming back together in unity and 2017, 40 years after the St. Louis Congress. I think of all the divisions, I think of churches that split, people suing each other over property, but each in their own church taking communion, not having to worry about those bothersome other people in Christ's body with whom they have become at odds of whom they speak ill as they gossip and, and get together and then and then what was described in the title of a book, Divided We Stand. Well, those days are over and uh, that's because the Holy Spirit is doing his perfect work and I know he is and it's continuing and I say, let us now, when this time of this, this isolation of COVID-19 is over and we're all back together and having the joy of our Eucharistic celebration, don't bring back, let's not bring back with us any of that old division ever again. Let's leave it forever behind. Just come back with faith, hope, and charity. Come back with the things that make for love and forgiveness and unity, unity of mind and purpose, that we want to love God and love one another, serve Christ, be a light to the world, spread his gospel, invite people in to partake of Christ and his salvation in our fellowship and to be the people filled with the spirit who testify of him in life and death and in all that we say and do. Leave behind all those old divisions. Don't bring back when this time of purging is over. Don't bring back jealousies, envying, any of the... Read the epistles of Paul. He talks about these things to the church. Things do without. Leave these things behind. Let them not be once named among you as become saints. And come back with, with faith, hope, charity. All of which bring about those things I mentioned, the forgiveness, the unity. Because we are bound together with Christ in one body, as one body, in the new covenant 
that he established with his own death and the shedding of his own blood as the testator of the New Testament and as the new covenant himself of salvation. Conclude with the collect from Monday Thursday. Let us pray. Almighty Father, whose dear Son, on the night before he suffered, did institute the sacrament of his body and blood, mercifully grant that we may thankfully receive the same in remembrance of him, who in these holy mysteries giveth us a pledge of life eternal, the same thy Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who now liveth and reigneth with thee, and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. My dear brothers and sisters, the peace of God which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always.